Hello everybody, welcome to the Ultimate Physics channel. The topic of today's video is Discovery of the X-rays and the Electron William Ronchon and J.J. Thomson During the fang end of the 19th century, scientists discovered phenomena that could not be explained using the classical ideas of physics. Despite the successes of classical theories, a few exceptions to the classical ideas that were discovered led to the two of the most fabulous theories of modern physics, namely the special theory of relativity and the quantum theory of matter and radiation. While the special theory of relativity proposed in 1905 is largely the brainchild of Albert Einstein, quantum physics was developed between 1900 to 1930 by a large number of physicists starting from Planck, Einstein, Bohr, Schrodinger, Heisenberg and Dirac, etc. Around that time, among the few important discoveries were the discovery of the X-rays by Ronchin and the discovery of the electron by J.J. Thomson. Robert Millikan later measured the charge to the mass ratio of the electron more accurately. Let us proceed to discuss these two discoveries in some detail. By the 1890s, scientists were aware through several experiments about the existence of strange rays then called as the cathode rays. These cathode rays were generated from one of the two metal plates between which a large potential is applied in an evacuated tube. The electrode from which these cathode rays emanated was the cathode which was kept at a negative potential compared to the anode towards which the these cathode rays moved because of the potential difference between the anode and the cathode. The origin and structure of the cathode rays was not known but the idea of atomic substructure was widely accepted because of the need to explain the chemical experiments. So it was surmised that there was a link between the cathode rays and the atoms. The penetrative power of the cathode rays was known and these rays were being intensively investigated around that time. The experimental setup used to study the cathode rays looks something like this. This is basically the evacuated class tube. The anode and cathode are basically metal plates. The terminals of batteries are connected to these. The negative terminals of the battery, a high tension battery, are connected to the cathode, and the positive terminal is connected to the anode here. And <coughs> The cathode rays are emitted from the cathode and they move towards the anode because of the potential difference. And then they strike the anode here. But this is the evacuated gas too uh, in which this experiment is performed. This experiment was about studying the passage of electric current through low pressure gases. In 1895, Wilhelm Röntgen was studying the passage of cathode rays through these gases. He observed that the phosphorus screen present in the darkened room in which he was doing the experiments was glowing vividly in the dark. Soon, he realized that these rays are different from the cathode rays that he was studying and unlike the cathode rays, these rays were unaffected by any electric or magnetic fields. Therefore, he was not sure what kind of rays these were and he called them X-rays and understood that these X-rays were produced by the cathode rays bombarding the walls of the evacuated glass tube. Rondon studied the transmission of X-rays through several materials and he even uh, got the image of bones in a hand uh, when X-rays were made to pass through the hand. This experiment created a lot of excitement among physicists and medical applications of X-rays were soon developed. 
Wilhelm Röntgen received the first Nobel Prize in Physics in 1901 for the discovery of X-rays. Now let us know about the man himself. Wilhelm Röntgen was born in Germany in 1845, but he was brought up in the Netherlands. He attended the University of Zurich, where he graduated with a degree in Mechanical Engineering. After several university appointments, he was appointed as a Chair of Physics at the University of Munich, where he spent the rest of his life. Wilhelm Röntgen preferred walking alone and built all his equipment himself. He refused to benefit from any of his discoveries and died nearly bankrupt in 1923 after the First World War. <coughs> now let us proceed to discuss the discovery of the electrons. The discovery of electrons had its origins several years before the discovery of X-rays. J. A. Thompson, working in the prestigious Cavendish Laboratory at Cambridge University, was another of the several scientists of the day studying the passage of <coughs> cathode rays or electricity through gases. The apparatus used by Thompson was similar to the one used by Ronjan as well as several other scientists. The experimental setup used to study the cathode rays goes something like this. We have an evacuated tube. And you have your uh, cathode here. The anode is here. Deflecting plates, positive and negative, let's say. The cathode and the anode are connected to separate the battery. And there is a small hole in the anode plate through which the cathode rays will be able to travel. And then there is a collimator again here. That collimates this beam of cathode rays into a small beam, tiny beam. And, and it narrows down the beam. So the beam becomes narrower here. And this single beam of cathode rays could be deflected using these electric plates. And because the positive terminal is shown here to be on the <coughs> top, typically the electrons would be attracted in this direction and therefore they would deviate here and strike a fluorescent screen that is present here at this end of the evacuated tube, evacuated glass tube and then you could also simultaneously uh, use a magnet all pieces of a magnet to, to control this deflection of the cathode ray um, particles. So I am showing this whole piece of this magnet like this. It goes inside the board because the other pole is present on the other side here. That is how this can be uh, imagined. So this is a setup which is very similar to the one that is used to study the X-rays. Uh, the accidental discovery of X-rays by Wilhelm Röntgen also used a similar subsetter. Several other uh, scientists were also using <coughs> such uh, equipment to study the passage of electric current through low pressure gases in such evacuated discharge tubes. By then, cathode rays were known to them, but the exact nature was not clear. Thompson believed that these were particles, but several others, such as Hertz, believed them to be rays. In 1897, Thompson was able to show that these charged particles emitted by the cathode were indeed the same as the cathode rays. These particles from the cathode were attracted to the positive potential on the aperture uh, at the anode. The second aperture on plate here is the collimator and that collimates the rays. The potential applied on the deflecting plates 
is used to deflect the cathode rays. Previously, Hertz performing the same experiment had observed no deflection of the charged particles due to the plates. But Thomson, on further evacuation of the tube, was able to measure the deflections and thereby convincingly prove the negative charge on the cathode ray particles for which he was awarded the Nobel Prize in the year 1906. Now let us show what is happening at the deflection plates in some detail. We have the two deflection plates connected to the terminals of a battery and a thin beam of cathode rays that comes from the collimator. Uh, if the battery is switched off here, it would go straight and uh, hit the folds in screen here. But when the battery is switched on, there is a deflection here and uh, this starts reflecting and goes like this. Now with respect to the horizontal line here, we can mark this angle as theta which is called as, let us say, the leaning angle. That is the angle at which the cathode rays leave the region where the deflection plates are there. And the length of that region is, let us call it L. And if the velocity at this point is the velocity at which the cathode rays enter here, the horizontal velocity or the velocity in the uh, x direction here, and this is y direction perpendicular to the plates and at the x direction if the velocity of entry of the cathode ray beam is v naught then the time taken for the cathode rays to traverse through the deflection plates is t is equal to the distance l with the velocity v naught so distance over velocity v naught now there is a force on the cathode rays due to the electric field applied between the plates and this force is the electric force and uh, <coughs> to balance this electric force or to neutralize this electric force a magnetic field is applied perpendicular to the electric field and this is shown as field pointing into the board here because perpendicular means there could be two directions, one is pointing out or the other one could be pointing into the board. In this case, we are considering the field pointed into the board. And therefore, that is represented by a cross uh, circle around. Now, that is a magnetic field P. And the electric field here is, let us call that as E. With this information, we can proceed to discuss some. Uh, physics of it using equations. Now the collimated beam of cathode rays on reaching the fluorescent screen produces flashes of light. These could be deflected based on the polarity of the plates as well as the magnetic fields. Thus Thompson showed that the cathode rays could be manipulated using electric and magnetic fields. The technique that Thompson developed to measure the charge to mass ratio of the cathode ray particles is not a standard technique. It is now used as a classic example to study and understand the behavior of charged particles in crossed electric and magnetic fields. When the magnetic field is switched off, the electrons are accelerated in the y direction because they are deviating this way, right? They are accelerated in the y direction with an upward force, right? Because of the electric field and that force began and with an upward force Fy is equal to that is mass times acceleration Ay which is equal to Q times, let us say the charge on the particle here is Q, times the electric field E. So the force on the charged particle using Newton's equations is mass times acceleration and the acceleration occurs in the y direction. So I put a suffix y here that is equal to Q E. So we can write Ay simply as the acceleration as Q over M E. And we got an expression for the time uh, that is taken by these particles to traverse this distance. Then we can consider the leaving angle here, tan theta, 
of the tandem. So tan theta, theta is angle. Tan theta we can write as the y component of the velocity here and the x component vx. The y component of velocity is nothing but the acceleration ay times the time taken for the particle to traverse this. That is from the Newton's equations, v is equal to at. And here vx is the initial velocity with which it enters here, the x component of that velocity v naught. So we write that. And for ay, we are going to substitute q over m times e. So q, e, m. And for v naught, we can substitute, uh, sorry, for t, we can substitute l. And already there is a v naught here. And then we are v naught we are bringing in, so it's v naught square. Now, if the initial velocity at this point v naught is known, then from this equation we can get the q over m ratio. So q over m is equal to um, tan theta. V naught square over E times L. So this is the expression for Q over M. Now, when the magnetic field is switched on and this deflection is balanced, the electric and magnetic fields become equal. So there is no net force on the charged particles here. That is the cathode rays in this case. And therefore, we can say that when the force, net force, is equal to zero that means the sum of the uh, electric force and the magnetic force has got to be zero so we can consider only the magnitudes in this case let us say QE must be therefore in uh, magnitude equal to uh, Q V B right and then of course the charge is a common factor here so the velocity becomes a ratio of E to the B so in this case the velocity is V naught so I say that it is V naught is equal to E over B so we are interested in only the magnitude of the electric and magnetic fields here now this is the condition for balancing this uh, beam, that is uh, for nullifying any force on it, net force is zero in this case, and if we substitute B is equal to U over B in this equation, I will write that part here, here for V naught square I am taking uh, E square over B square here, so it is Q over M that is charge to mass ratio for the cathode ray particles is tan theta times uh, E square or the E is present already here L times B square now this E and this E will cancel out so effectively we have the Q over M ratio as Q over M ratio is E tan theta over uh, B square L. So thus, if we know the magnitudes of the electric and magnetic fields that we are using in this experiment, uh, and by measuring the leaning angle theta, and of course the uh, length of the reflection plates, we will be able to get the charge to mass ratio of the cathode rays in this case, or for that matter, any other charged particles that we use in this experiment. So this is a standard technique to study the behavior of charged particles in cross electric and magnetic fields. So this is the final expression for charge to mass ratio in this experiment. Thomson's value of E by M or Q by M that is measured in this experiment was about one third less than the presently accepted value of 1.76 into 10 power 11. Coulomb per kg value.
Thomson realized that the value of E by M thus obtained is larger than the anticipated value and larger than any E by M measured before, such as for hydrogen, for example, by about 1000 times. It was clear to him that either the charge for the electron is very small or the mass very large or both. The electrons were found to be more penetrating in comparison to the atoms or molecules. Joseph John Thomson, popularly known as JJ by his peers, was born in 1856 and went to Cambridge University when he was just 20. He remained there for the rest of his life. His career at the Cavendish Laboratory spanned over 50 years, during which he was also a director for over 30 years, before he stepped down in favour of Ernest Rutherford. Cavendish Laboratory benefited immensely from his presence, uh, the testimony to which lies in the fact that he and his peers bagged a whopping seven Nobel Prizes during his stint. That brings us to the conclusion of this video. I shall catch up with you on another interesting video soon. Until then, it's bye from me. Cheers.